Hey, um, so I had this idea some few minutes ago uh, for this video. I thought it might be fun to do uh, because, um, you know, hot takes are a thing now, right? Um, and uh, I think that not liking something that everyone likes is a lot hotter of a take than liking things that nobody else does. But that's what we're going to talk about. Um, what this movie is going to be, it, or this video is going to be, is the 25 movies that I have on my letterbox to count rated a perfect 5 out of 5, the highest rating one can give a movie, with the lowest average overall rating based on everyone's collective ratings on Letterboxd. Um, you know, generally, uh, something once it's at like a you know the mid threes it's considered very good i think that like a like a like an average movie usually is hovering around the three ish range and stuff once it gets up to four you're talking about like all timers um but below three that's generally like not well liked um and then these are all going to be that low. Um, I do, I did notice that there is a, a common theme that there are a lot of movies on that are going to be on this list that are um, often cited amongst the sort of craze of a so bad it's good type of films, um, exemplified by the most famous one, Time Wise Owes the Room. Um, I personally don't um, ascribe to the concept of something being so bad it's good, and a lot of people who like movies and and you know seek out bad movies that are good uh, have a very sort of uh, mean spirited and pretentious sort of uh, take on them where I feel like they think that they're better than the movie. Like, they're above it, and they mock it, and they look down on it, and that's not where I want to come from. I, you know, rate a movie ultimately based on how much I enjoyed it. And I can enjoy it for a number of reasons, you know. Um, and a lot of the times, if something is a bad movie, in the sense that it's maybe technically inept, or, you know, amateurish, or sloppy, that can enhance the viewing pleasure experience to me sometimes not all the time but sometimes you know if you if you if the right forces are at work and so that's you know um that's kind of my my thought where it's like it's not really about how good of a movie it is it's about how much fun it is or how much i enjoyed watching it um and so there are going to be a lot of movies that show up on here that are frequent targets of bad but good um but there are also going to be some things that are maybe not as uh frequently talked about or that you may not have heard of um things that aren't going to show up on here are things that are just really bad uh and like not fun um something like uh, kirk cameron's saving christmas or uh, food fight the animated children's film about various food mascots um like the star kissed tuna man and shit like that um things like that are just painful they just are painful and unfun uh going overboard with adam sandler from before he was on snl one of the most painful uh, experiences i think you can ever have watching a movie trying to watch that film um those are the true bad movies, right? Um, I think that if you you make a, a piece of art, your goal is to move someone, have them feel something, you know, positive. You know, maybe it's not happiness, but it's positive, right? Um, and, you know, going overboard is the opposite of that. It's like Abu Ghraib shit. <laughs> to me you know that's that's obviously i shouldn't joke about that and that's that's a, a pretty extreme uh hyperbole but 
you know what I mean. Um, so let's just jump in. We're going to do 25 movies uh, in ascending order from the most highest rated to the lowest rated uh, on average. But again, these are all movies that I have given a 5 out of 5 that I really love these movies. So the first one on our list is from 2012, uh, and it is Harmony Korine's Spring Breakers, starring James Franco, Vanessa Hudgens, and Selena Gomez, alongside others, including Gucci Mane. Come on in sunshine. Wakey, Shine, little bitch. Where's the money? Money, money. What? You know what? <laughs> All I know is I'm not gonna sit here another day. It's spring break. How are we gonna get enough money? I don't in know. Time? We're the only ones still here. It's spring break. I'm tired of seeing the same thing. It's spring break. It's your chance to see something different. It's spring break. Just get that cash. Pretend like it's a video game. We can do this. It's spring break. Twist the fires in the clothes on the yard. I got the yard. Down a hodgepodge pop. What a magic place, y'all! You can change who you are, y'all. Bikinis and big booties, y'all. That's what life is about. Who are you? My name's Aileen. Why are you here? I saw y'all in there. They like nice people. Come on, y'all. Why you acting suspicious? <laughs> I knew y'all was special from the moment I saw you. It's written on your faces. Because I just have a really, really bad feeling about this. Let's cause some trouble now. Break, break, bitches! I got my dark tan and oil. Lay out by the pool. This is the American dream, y'all. Spring break. Y'all want to die tonight? Spring break. Get down! You're scared, aren't you? Spring break forever. Spring break forever, bitches. My loneliness oh. is killing me at night. I must confess, I still believe. Still This has an average rating of 2.8 out of 5 on Letterboxd. Um, and I really love this movie. I actually just, for my birthday in August, about two months ago, uh, I went to see a screening of this at the Trilon, which is a, uh, an art house uh, theater in Minneapolis. But with a couple of my friends I dragged along for my birthday. They had never seen the movie before. They were kind of, they, they li I think they liked it, but were maybe a little weirded out by it. But they have started a uh, running inside joke where they just say, spring break, spring break forever. Um, which is fine. I think that's, a, I mean, that's deservedly so. Um, this movie was kind of weird because it, it was like, you know, Korean, Harmony Korean, he's coming from the art house, experimental cinema you know, doesn't have a strong narrative focus in his films. His films are a lot more about tone. And um, then he's making this movie that's this, you know, it's seemingly like commercial film. He's got this big movie star, James Franco. He's got these like teen idols in Selena Gomez, Vanessa Hudgens, Disney Channel actresses. Um, and so what ended up happening, I think, was that all of the art house people who liked Harmony Korine were turned off because it was like him sort of selling out doing this mainstream thing. And then all of the mainstream people who saw it really hated it because it was this weird sort of tone piece. It was a, a Harmony Korine movie, you know, it, it has less of a focus on narrative, a lot more sort of surreal, dreamlike qualities to it. Um, but I just love this movie. I just think it's such a such a great movie. It really captures the feeling of being that age, being like a you know a young adult, and feeling lost. And it captures um, the 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 sort of dichotomy with the Selena Gomez's character, 
being sort of afraid of this world of partying and how uncomfortable she is with all of it. That's very real. I've experienced that for sure. Um, being young and hanging out with older, scary people who are like fucked up on meth and stuff. Um, but then also the allure of that world and how it draws you in and the excitement and the power and all the amphetamines and all of that. It, it, it is very real. Um, also possibly the best cold open of a movie ever. Just the opening s scene of slow motion nude people on the beach pouring alcohol all over each other while Skrillex plays in the background. Just, mm, just like the perfect thesis statement for the film to just really start you off right. And seeing that in the theater is wonderful. I just was so giddy getting to see that. Um, yeah, this is one that just is weird. It, it's strange to me that it's so low. But I think what I said about how it kind of it splits the difference and ends up having no real home is probably the reason why it's as low as it is. And I think that's a similar thing that can be said about the next film on this list, 2006's Southland Tales, directed by Richard Kelly, the man who made Donnie Darko. I'm going to tell you the story of the journey down the road not taken. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Sorted tales of how it all came crashing down. This is an epic Los Angeles crime saga. And you're researching your role? Yes. It takes place in the near future. Scientists are saying the future is going to be far more futuristic than they originally predicted. You're gonna have to wear a bulletproof vest. You think I'm there, but I Let's talk about your phone. What's it really about? Here. Don't look so scared, Mr. Santeros. The future is just like you imagine. Ah! Someone must be hiding it. It's like the nervous breakdown of the century. Nothing that a killer, a porn star, and a tattoo parlor can't handle. <laughs> teenager and Donnie Darko had was pretty new at the time uh, you know I didn't see it uh, when it came out but I saw it for the first time about two years after it came out when I was 13 and I was really into it I got really into it I went when the director's cut came out again I made my parents take me to go see it in the theater for my birthday um, in 2004 um, but uh, my love of that movie steeply declined over time. It's uh, I think it's a it's a very great example of something that feels very profound and deep when you are young and don't really know a lot. Things are still very new, um, you know. And when you look at it with a more adult eye, it's it's a lot m less uh, profound than it seemed when you were thirteen. Um, but its follow-up, this movie, Southland Tales, uh, it feels like nobody really liked. Um, and when it came out, uh, I thought it was pr pretty good. Like, it was, I, I liked it fine. Uh, but then I didn't see it again for a really long time, 
15 years until this year when uh, Arrow Films finally released on Blu-ray the uh, can cut, which was um, when the film the film debuted at uh, the Cannes Film Festival in 2005, and it was almost a half hour longer than the final version, and um, it was like universally panned. People called it like one of the worst films in the history of the festival and all of these things. And there were a number of uh, special effects shots that still needed to be finished. And basically what ended up happening was the studio offered Richard Kelly a deal where he had to cut a half hour out of the movie. And then in exchange, they would give him the money to finish the effects shots that he wanted for the movie. And so that can cut went unseen to the public for 15 years until the Blu-ray came out. Um, and I watched it, and I was just totally blown away. Um, this is a crazy movie. It, it's a, you know... Um, so when you say the, the cast, you've got Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, Sean William Scott, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Justin Timberlake, Mandy Moore, Will Sasso, John Lovitz. Uh, you've got John Larroquette, Janine Garofalo, Sherry O'Terry, Amy Poehler, Wally Shawn, Kevin Smith, the director. Um, just tons and tons and tons of people, mostly comedy people. Um, or, you know, we've got a lot of comedy people, a lot of SNL, Mad TV people. And then you've got, um, like, these big like pop culture A-list actors like Mandy Moore and Dwayne Johnston, Justin Timberlake, you know. Um, and so when it's the movie is this sort of like madcap, weird mystery, very densely layered uh, movie that's like about a near future Los Angeles where... Um, it's so complicated. How can I even explain what this movie is about? They have there's this German company that has created this machine called Fluid Karma that's going to be a perpetual motion machine that uses the current of the ocean to solve the energy crisis. But what they're not telling everybody is that the machine is ripping holes in the fabric of space and time. And there's uh, the Rock plays this action st star who has amnesia who has written this screenplay that's about the apocalypse that people think is prophetic and then there's this pop star played by sarah michelle geller who's having visions of the future and then there's these two police officers that are identical twins that are played by sean william scott and one of them is trying to infiltrate this group of marxists who are plotting to overthrow the government which has become incredibly uh like fascistic in, in this expansion of the patriot act in the wake of terrorist attacks that happened in texas a year's number of years prior to the film it's a lot and it's like a big movie it's like almost three hours long and then it also was meant to be the the third part of a trilogy the first two parts were in comic book form but then it ended up being scaled down a bit. So it's basically half the story. You get a ton of backstory and explanation if you read those those graphic novels that's not present in the film. Very ambitious idea. Not a very smart idea, I have to say. Um, so when this movie is not very well liked, and I think I understand why, it's definitely a diamond in the rough kind of movie. Um, you know? Like, there's a lot of things that you can single out as being bad or wrong or poor decisions about the movie or weird choices that the movie makes but it is so ambitious and so crazy and like this insane thing that has no right to exist this many people of this caliber in this weird and esoteric of a thing that has this big of a budget is just like unheard of in Hollywood and it this was probably the last time that something like this was allowed to happen movies with this big of a cast are not this weird anymore it is just not possible and there's something I really admire about that um 
I, you know, I think that this movie has absolutely been slept on and uh, is underrated, very underrated. And uh, if you have interest in it, get uh, your hands on that can cut of the movie. I don't know if you can get it on streaming or if you can only view that version of it through the Blu-ray, but uh, it's worth the, the 15 or 20 bucks that you'll have to drop to get that Blu-ray, I have to say. Very good movie. Next, we have one that um, is not nearly as well known as those first two, probably. Uh, from 1986, directed by Corey Yen, uh, with also a 2.8 out of 5. We have No Retreat, No Surrender. I am pleased to present our Russian brother, Eastern Europe's most feared martialist, Ivan Krasinski! Contact Karate, the world's deadliest game, is being kicked apart by the syndicate Soviet mean machine, leaving only one man left to stop him, Jason Stilwell. You've been fighting again. So what? You know how I feel about fighting. Yeah, I do. You're scared to death of it. Jason believed in the way of the dragon, but others didn't. Eat me up. Don't worry, I'm nobody's lunch. Now you force my hand. An example must be made. You see? Sensei Lee, you have to help me! Then one day, the dragon returned. You know. You asked me to come. This is a movie that uh, was, you know, so in in the 80s, the sort of direct-to-video knockoff market was uh, in full effect. Big, big thing. So if there was ever a movie that was popular, it was guaranteed that there was going to be a bajillion low-budget direct-to-video rip-offs of it that would come out. And so when The Karate Kid was successful, that inspired a litany of knockoffs. And one of them, my favorite of them, is No Retreat, No Surrender, which also happens to star the first film role of Jean-Claude Van Damme as the uh, antagonist of the film, the rival uh, kickboxer of the main character. Uh, I'm just going to look at my, my letterbox review of it. Yeah, okay. Here's what I, I said in my letterbox review when I, when I first watched this movie. I said, holy shit, this Karate Kid ripoff is absolutely the perfect kind of insane that I want from my ripoffs. We have a pre-blood sport JCVD a sidekick who break dances and raps about karate, a tag team of karate bullies, one of whom is a fat boy who constantly has barbecue sauce all over his face, yet somehow still commands the respect of his cronies, as well as a karate dad who is the biggest wimp in the history of cinema. And of course, Bruce Lee's ghost. Who needs Mr. Miyagi to train you when you have Bruce Lee's fucking ghost? Jean-Claude Van Damme has a brief fight at the opening and then does not show up again until the finale. There are four fights in the film, and all of them are actually really good. This was made by a legit Hong Kong guy, Corey Yun, who is best known for being Jet Li's fight choreographer in a ton of his American films, and also directed a little movie you may have heard of called The Transporter. 
There is definitely some cross-cultural feedback, resulting in some of the total insanity that is happening in the movie, but Yen makes martial arts films, and as such, the training and fighting scenes here are legitimately awesome. Also, at the emotional climax of the film, a character literally screams the title of the movie at the main character, 7 out of 5 stars. I think I said it pretty well there. <laughs> um, man, yeah. Wow, that movie rules. Um, there's a there's a number of sequels to it as well. I think they made up to four, maybe. No, they made one, two, and three. And I've seen the second one. The second one was was not that good. It wasn't. It was whatever. It didn't have the charm or the Jean Claude of the first one. <sighs> Next, uh, we have a pretty legendary '80s movie um, and the f uh, a, a children's movie uh, and. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of children's movies, uh, for the most part. Uh, I'm not a Disney guy, uh, at all. And, um, you know, there aren't a ton of children's movies that I have a lot of nostalgia for. But one that I do have is this one, 1989's The Wizard, directed by Todd Holland, starring Fred Savage and Jenny Lewis. Jenny Lewis, the the woman who would go on to front Ryle O'Kiley and then break off into her own successful music career. She started as a child actress uh, before she retired from acting at a very young age to pursue music. Two tickets to California, please. That's two hundred and twenty-six dollars. Well, we only have twenty-seven dollars and thirty cents. Where does that get us? Nowhere. Corey's taking his brother Jimmy on a ride. These two boys already traveled more than eighty miles across the state. We've hired someone to find him. What's his problem? He's just shy. But Jimmy's got a secret. You got 50,000 on Double Dragon? That could make this the ride of their lives. Look at him. He's a wizard. He's headed for the video championship. <laughs> this guy? What is that? Power glove. Yeah, well, uh, just keep your power gloves up for all right. With a touch of romance. I am not kissing a boy. And a ton of trouble. Got you. We're too late. Put me down! Sorry about that, you maniac! They'll get there any way they can. Jimmy! Here we come! It's Jimmy! Jimmy. It's Jimmy. Come here! Oh. Stop them. think you're doing to him all his life you've been telling him to do what you want him to do how about once you ask him what he wants to do huh now video armageddon it's gonna take a lot of guts you can do it a little magic you're the best and the wizard fred savage The Wizard. Um, and so this is a pretty notorious movie for being... Uh, people consider this movie to be pretty bad. Oh, this movie also has Christian Slater in it. How could I forget? Um, and uh, it's a story of uh, three children, uh, who one of whom is very traumatized uh, and like uh, mute, basically. Um, and then the kids figure out that he's really good at video games, and so they go on this madcap cross-country road trip to California while they're being chased by various people who are trying to catch them and send the kid away to, like, a group home or something. And they're trying to get to the world video game championships that are being held by Nintendo, uh, so that he can enter this tournament and win. Um... This movie is notorious for basically being a 90-minute commercial for Nintendo, featuring, uh, like, an obscene amount of, of product placement. Uh, notoriously, the scene where they debut the Power Glove, with the famous line, the Power Glove, it's so bad. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of the movie, when they go to the tournament, they're forced to play the then-unannounced game Mario 3, Super Mario Bros. 3, which was the, the for first reveal that that game existed and people saw footage of it in the film and etc etc um so i'm not gonna pretend that this movie is like you know anything special really 
um, it's pretty much beat for beat, like a, you know, what you expect from a movie like this doesn't do anything super interesting, but what it does do is really capture what I felt like growing up watching this movie. Um, you know, so I was born in 90, so it's a little before my time, but, um, you know, in the, the mid nineties, say 95 to 97, when, uh, I was playing primarily the NES, SNES games and I was going to Mr. Movies, uh, to rent videos, uh, with my parents on 50 cent Tuesdays, I was renting the wizard a lot, you know, I was very into the wizard. And, uh, you know, that nostalgia goes a long ways for me. Um, so that's why this is as high as it is on this list. Um, why well, I rate, rate it five stars. You know, I have no delusions about this movie. It's just one of those things that I really have a lot of nostalgia for. Next is one that I'm surprised is rated so low. Um, it's with a 2.7 out of 5 from director Ethan Wiley, 1987's House 2, The Second Story. Um. Last year, audiences everywhere thrilled to a terrifying film about the horrors of home ownership. House. Now, there's an all-new house. It's like you got some kind of alternate universe in there or something. With brand new owners. Charlie. Huh? Got it. And it's getting weirder. Look, it's a prehistoric bird. I got you, Jack. I've seen enough tragedy and disaster to make you want to upchuck in your shorts. Two friends inherit a fantastic house. Charlie, there's a jungle in there. And a 170-year-old mummy. Surprise! Who is this? You can call me Gramps. No. They're in for more trouble than they ever imagined. You can kick the door open, run in there blindly, and I'll cover you, okay? Guy with the big gun goes first. House 2, a second story. This place gives me the creeps. House is, you know, a pretty uh, famous 80s horror movie about a haunted house. And House 2 is uh, a sequel, but only in spirit in the fact that it's about a haunted house. It has nothing to do with the first movie. Again, I'm going to just sort of read my letterbox review of it here from when I watched it. I said, this has to be one of the best kids movies that I have ever seen. Not much of a horror movie, but it does make Indiana Jones 4, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, feel completely pointless. This has everything that you would ever want from an adventure movie about a crystal skull. I could not believe how funny this movie was. On a regular basis, I was falling out laughing. Royal Dano is always great in everything, but he is super awesome in this one. And when John Ratzenberger shows up, he ends up basically stealing the whole movie with his 10-minute appearance. Uh, John Ratzenberger from Cheers, of course. Um, the sidekick character, Charlie, who is played by Jonathan Stark, is also in incredible. How did this guy not even get remotely famous for acting? He went on to do lots of sitcom writing, but man, he is seriously funny in this. All of the effects are super fun. Great mix of stop motion and practical effects and puppeteering. The zombie makeup on Gramps and the villain are both fantastic. The movie is perfectly paced consistently exciting and enjoyable and keeps you on the hook all the way through to the end honestly i think i like it even more than the first one um people really compared to the first one too so like this is a 2.7 and the original has a 3.0 so not a huge difference but still you know like people like the first one more um it's it's good but like this is just like like it's a family horror movie, which is hard to pull off, I think, and I think it pulls it off really well. Um, you know, it's got a pretty great cast of uh, really funny character actors, 
fortunately it does have Bill Maher in it, um, but I won't hold that against the film. Um, it's just so good. Uh, and Arrow has put out uh, a Blu-ray of it that you can get, and uh, yeah, it's great. Next is another movie that I'm surprised is rated so low. Um, this movie uh, was filmed in the early to mid-2000s and then spent uh, a number of years uh, on the shelf in uh, like post-production hell before finally being released in 2008. I remember there was an uh, ad for it on my DVD of Sideways which came out four years earlier. Um, and that is uh, The Onion Movie. Only one news organization has the guts to tell it like it is. According to a new medical study, depression hits losers hardest. The Onion Movie, America's unrated news source. The crucial stories. News from Detroit. American Automotive announced a safety recall of all cars containing neck belts. The neck belts have been found to cause violent decapitation. Daddy's home! Hi, Dad. The Essential Interviews. Melissa Cherry is America's biggest pop sensation. But is this young singer sending the wrong message? My music isn't about sex. The Fundamental Concerns. Congress passed legislation restricting smoking within U.S. borders to a single room in Des Moines. Smokers from across the country are making the long journey to the 10 by 10 Smokers Lounge in Iowa. Move the car, you old bitch! And the hard-hitting movie previews. Master, how did they defeat me? They used an ancient technique that strikes at the very core of a warrior's strength. Yeah. Oh. You, my young pupil, shall become a cock puncher. Steven Seagal is cock puncher. I don't think you have the balls. See all this and more in The Onion Movie, America's unrated news source. That was awesome! Coming soon to DVD. The movie of the satirical news magazine the onion um so uh you know it's in the tradition of the sort of sketch comedy film something like K kentucky fried movie um where you've got a sort of wraparound framing narrative um but and then skits and the skits tie in sometimes they tie into each other etc um and then it does take uh, a sort of the, the the wraparound thing is that it's you know the newscaster reporting on uh, you know various stories which are where the skits are coming from. But then there's also like commercials for products and um, uh, maybe the most famous part of the movie is there's recurring commercials for the new Steven Seagal film Cock Puncher, where he punches people in the cock really hard until they die. Um, this movie has a ton of really funny, talented people in it, and it doesn't really, I, as I remember it, and I've seen it somewhat recently, um, it doesn't really have any bad skits in it. I think it's pretty consistently funny the whole way through, and uh, me and my friends, this came out like right around when I finished high school, and we would watch this fucking movie all the time. We were so into this movie. Um, and I still have it on DVD, um... It is up on streaming services, so you can, you know, rent it or whatever. But on physical media, it's kind of hard to find. Um, I don't think it's ever made it off of DVD. I don't... I think it's... Yeah, it's only available on DVD. Uh, so it's never been play, pressed on Blu-ray at all. It's basically just, you know, they, they the studio threw it out there, uh, direct to video, and forgot about it, uh, which is really sad uh, because it's really good. And it's only got a 2.7 out of 5 on here. Um, and even, I'm like looking and, and like the popular reviews, you know, one of the most the popular reviews of it, has, it gives it a, the worst review that you can. And uh, it's only got 3,000 watches. The most popular review of the movie only has 22 likes. It's, it's, it's very underseen. 
Um, which is too bad, because it's very funny. Next, I think I talked about this in another movie or video. No, wait, it was a video that I shot, but I didn't end up editing or doing anything with. Um, and uh, this is a movie that was absolutely reviled uh, and hated when it came out, but over the years has gained something of a cult following and a critical appreciation. Uh, and that is 2001's Freddy Got Fingered, written, directed, and starring Tom Green. Um, it's yours. Hop in. LeBaron. Bet your boots. It's LeBaron. Look, it says number one son in the license plate. That's me. I'm the number one son. It's never easy to let go. You make your daddy proud. You hear me? I'm going to make you so proud. You make your daddy proud. Proud. Get the hell away! Now, are you really excited about starting to work at the sandwich factory tomorrow? Hello? Can you hear me? There's probably people at the factory that have been making cheese sandwiches their entire lives, and they're going to look at me. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And they're going to call me a loser. Ooh, you can't hurt me. Not with my cheese helmet. Hello? Hello? He couldn't handle the complexities of making a cheese sandwich, so now he's back at home. <laughs> the treasure that's up on a rope are you imbecile oh no the treasure it went into that underwater cave he thinks different you want to just barge into a restaurant and expect someone to give you a tv show uh i don't know um yeah hey he talks different I can walk backwards fast as you can. And at the backwards, man, the backwards, man. I can walk backwards fast as you can. What God name are you doing? And he acts. Ah! Ah! Different. No, 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 no. My plan. Give me my plan. But that's only because. Ah! He is. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that to happen. You missed the Pathetic loser. Is this your dad? Boom! Ah! Regency Enterprises presents Tom Green. He's a stupid. Not stupid. He's a stupid. Not stupid. He's stupid. Not stupid. Ah! Freddy got fingered. Now, if you'll excuse me, I still have some work to do. Daddy, would you like some sausage? Daddy, would you like some sausage? We're real proud of it. I think I could have come up with a better title. The, the rating spread for this film on Letterboxd is really interesting, where it's got almost the same number of ratings, like, the entire way across the rating spectrum, which is a very weird... There's, like, a ton of really bad reviews, a ton of really good reviews, and then a ton of, like, right-down-the-middle reviews. I don't know if I've ever seen a, a breakdown like that for a movie before, but it does kind of make sense. Um... And so, this is a comedy film. Tom Green was a guy who had a TV show. If you're, you know, young, you, you might not know who Tom Green even is. Um, Tom Green had a show on MTV. He had a show in Canada throughout the 90s, which was then eventually picked up by MTV in the late 90s. And then they made their own version of it, which was reusing footage from his older show and then new stuff as well. And he was just this cultural phenomenon in that sort of era of like 99 to 2001 when things were very edgy and in your face and over the top gross out you know uh extreme and he did content that was a lot of like man on the street prank stuff social engineering experiments an obvious precursor to someone like eric andre who has stated that Tom Green was a major influence on his brand. Um, and, you know, since he was so successful, basically, um, the studio gave him a, an obscene amount of money, to like $30 million, I think, to make this movie. And the whole movie, it feels like an elaborate practical joke about the fact that they have given him this money to make the movie. It's almost as though he has set out to make the stupidest, dumbest, weirdest, most unlikable, 
uncommercial movie that he possibly could. And I just love that about it so much. Um, it is, you know, I, I think that like, um, this movie doesn't get, there are a lot of things in comedy where people will talk about like, you have to be smart to make something really dumb that's, that works or have dumb characters. Something like It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia is a great example. Um, and I think that's true about this movie. There's something of so genius about it. Um, like, the, the, the scene where they're at the restaurant, which is a sort of a, a prolonged scene. Uh, they're at this, this fancy, this fancy restaurant. Um, and things descend into chaos. And, um, there's like this, this moment where Tom Green has stolen the violin from the string quartet in the restaurant, and um, he jumps up on the bar, and the bartender, almost like off, like off camera, like eighty yard line, says, "You can't do that here. This is a fancy restaurant." And then he just starts like playing the chaos on the violin and screaming, "This is a fancy restaurant! This is a fancy restaurant!" And uh, there's just so many moments like that that are just, like, pure, unbridled, boiled down, pure, like, just intense chaos that I just love so much. It makes me laugh so hard every time. The part where he decides to prove he, that he was wrong and apologize to his girlfriend, he rents a helicopter to come and see her, and then he gives her a bag of jewels... The jewels, Betty. The jewels. <sighs> this movie's not going to be for everyone. Um, I'm, like it's, it's definitely got some like some stuff in it that's like edge lordy, try hardy stuff. The part where he's whipping the newborn baby around by its umbilical cord. The part where he's jerking off a horse. You know the part where he's wearing the skin of a roadkill and dancing around. But there's also moments that are like almost like the pure id of my brain, like my my reptilian lizard brain, like the part when he, he the, the, the story of the film, if, you, if it even matters, is that he's this, you know, man-child who lives at home, but he dreams of being an animator, he draws doodles, and he dreams of being an animator, but his dad doesn't believe in him, and he wants him to get out of the house. And so he goes to Hollywood, and he tries to pitch his doodles to this animation studio executive, and the executive is very normal and helpful and he's like so you're talented you're a good artist but like here are a handful of things some constructive criticism about like ways that you can improve your art and tom green immediately starts like screaming at the top of his lungs about how terrible he is and then takes out a gun and then starts screaming about how he should be dead and then sticks the gun in his mouth and is, like, hyperventilating while sucking on the gun and shrieking. And, like, yeah, life feels like that a lot of the time for me. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's comforting to see it represented in a film. Uh, this is another movie that uh, has not had a lot of love for its physical release um, and has never made it off of, blue, of DVD, has never had a Blu-ray release of it. Um, sad. Next is one that most people have probably not heard of. Um, this is from 1997 by one of the true masters of the world of Italian garbage, uh, Joe D'Amato, uh, one of the schlock masters of Italian cinema. Uh, and this is Emmanuel and the Last Cannibals. Amazon, led by you, and fully subsidized by my paper, of course. These pictures were taken not long ago by the famous anthropologist William Simmons. It's all about two adulterers of the Caib. I saw you with Mark. When? 
last night. So the Emmanuel or Black Emmanuel series was a series of films uh, in the 70s into the early 80s, I believe, uh, most of which starred uh, Laura Gemser as Emmanuel, and they are like sexploitation films um, where Emmanuel, Emmanuel is a sort of, uh, she's a journalist, a reporter, she's very sexually liberated. She travels the globe to report on stories and, you know, fucks the story out of people because she's very, you know, adventurous and sexually liberated. Um, but, of course, in the late 70s, the Italian cannibal movie was a huge deal. He had, um, you know, exemplified by things like Cannibal Holocaust and Cannibal Ferox. And, but there were, you know, many, many others. Um, and then this, so this movie was like, what if we took the very popular and, and uh, you know, sexy sexploitation Emmanuel films and then crossed it with the ultra gory uh, you know, Italian cannibal films and so both of those, you know the, it's a very problematic movie in a lot of ways um, has a lot of problematic things about race and gender and uh you know, it's it's an exploitation film, like it, truly at its core. It doesn't get much more exploitation-y than this. But it is like pure psychosis. It is like one of the craziest fucking things I've ever seen. Um, again, I think that um, reading my review of it is probably going to be the best way to explain it. I was extremely thrilled. When Severin's Blu-ray of Emmanuel and the Last Cannibal came through my work, I was familiar with Joe D'Amato, the famed Italian porno exploitation trash master who helmed films with names like Porno Holocaust, Erotic Nights of the Living Dead, and Super Hard Love, but I must admit I had never seen a single one of his almost 200 films. I have since seen a number of them. I had, however, seen a Black Emmanuel film, the first one, and I was not terribly impressed. It wasn't directed by D'Amato, but rather a man named Bito Albertini, another Italian exploitation guy, though less prolific or esteemed than our man Joe. I found Black Emmanuel, or as my VHS copy of it is called Emmanuel in Africa, to be fairly standard sexploitation fare. None of the sex or any of the parts in between were particularly impressive or interesting enough to hold my attention, but when I saw Cannibals on the cover of this film, I had hope. I had hope that a film that the film would be what it looked like, a sexploitation cannibal holocaust, and, well, it delivered. This is one of the purest films of unbridled, irredeemable trash that I have ever seen, and I loved every second of it. After the opening credits, basically the first thing that happens is a nurse gets her whole titty bit off by a she-cannibal. I was excited to see that D'Amato was going for the extreme gore right off the bat, even before the copious, and I mean copious, amounts of sex. Emmanuel is a photojournalist who, after doing an undercover piece in a New York psych ward, finds evidence of a long-thought-extinct tribe of Amazonian cannibals. With her handy cannibal expert, she flies south to trek through the jungle in search of them, and have sex with basically everyone she meets. Here is a list of some of the things that you will see in this film. A man gets his dick sliced off, very slowly, and then eaten. A chimpanzee smokes a cigarette, and puts on sunglasses, while he watches two women sexually bathe each other beneath a waterfall. A nun gets her nipple sawed off and then eaten. 
People claim that it is nighttime when it is very clearly daytime. The sun is out, but they say that it is dark outside. Hysterical women are constantly being slapped. Stupid women and their stupid emotions. The annual Feast of Fertility, in which a woman is stabbed in the vagina and then has her uterus cut out of her body and eaten. The movie was in fact not a direct response to Ruggiero Diodato's notorious video Nasty Cannibal Holocaust, but rather its predecessor, 1977's Ultimo Mondo Cannibale, the film credited with jump-starting the cannibal trend of the ensuing ten years. I haven't seen Diodato's first cannibal picture, but comparing Emmanuel to Cannibal Holocaust, many similarities are present, though I will say this, Emmanuel in The Last Cannibals has at least 40% less rape, 100% more consensual sex, and 100% less actual animal killing than Cannibal Holocaust does. I do also really like the character of Emmanuel in this film. Early on, she warns her anthropologist guide slash fuck toy that she is a fiercely independent woman who will not be tied down to one man. She fucks a guy who gives her a ride. She rubs a couple vaginas, briefly. She globetrots around the world doing crazy, dangerous shit, getting attacked by snakes and almost eaten. At one point, she pretends to be God, all in the name of getting a good story and a set of photos for the newspaper where she works. Although, obviously, all of this is obscured by about 50 pounds of celluloid filth, Emmanuel represents something of a feministic protagonist, self-possessed, career-driven, sex-positive, and adventurous. Certainly not a role model for children, perhaps, but much better than the blood bags that women usually are in movies that are this gory. Also, this gore. I was not expecting this level of gore. It is a cannibal movie, I get that, but this was like, wow, this is some really intense shit. Also, a lot of people rubbing their own or each other's vaginas, which I was also not expecting because this does not have hardcore inserts like some Emmanuel films do or other Italian films of the era. Uh, this is definitely the least soft core of any soft core porn that I have ever seen. Uh, there is a moment, though, about halfway through the film, when they first meet the hunter character out in the wild and begin talking about hunting. Emmanuel asks him why he doesn't hunt in Africa, where it's much safer, as opposed to here in the harsh jungles of the Amazon. The thrill of the hunt, he says, is the hunt itself, not the act of killing. Setting your mind upon a prey and tracking it down, that is what gives him pleasure. This can also obviously be said of Emmanuel as well. And the hunter reminds both us and her that humans can also be hunted. Emmanuel lives her whole life like a hunt, hunting for sexual gratification, adventure, and hunting for the great stories that drive her passion for her own reporting. Or maybe that's all a bunch of bullshit. Let's be honest, this is a movie about people fucking each other and eating each other. I highly doubt that Joe D'Amato meant for it to be anything more than that, and that's fine! It doesn't need to be anything more than that. It's a movie that knows exactly what it is, and who it is marketed to, and it does everything that you want it to do perfectly. I stand by that. I stand by all of that. I wrote that a while ago, but I stand by all of that. Um, this movie has a 2.7 out of 5. Here's a... I just noticed a review. Quite possibly the most thoughtless movie I've ever seen. Not in the sense of it being incredibly dumb and offensive in nearly every way which it totally is, but also being pitched so man manically and heedlessly into action, any action, that it does not take any time to think. <laughs> True, it is just like a constant barrage of crazy shit happening. Um, and I love that about it. Uh, it is just a, an insane movie. You know, it is truly a reprehensible, disgusting, insane spectacle. Um... And, and, and I, I love that about it. Next, we have our first appearance from a man who will be making a few more appearances on this list. Um, one of my favorite filmmakers, uh, honestly. Uh, I thought for a while I toyed with the idea of writing a book-length essay about this man and his films because I am so intrigued and obsessed with them. Um, and th this film is his most recent, uh, from the year 2018, uh, we, and we've got Twisted Pear by Neil Breen. My 
name is Cade. I have an identical twin brother, Kale. Then one day it all changed. There was a bright light in the sky and time stood still. We were both selected. The pure majesty of nature. Programmable virtual reality. The corrupt version. A limitless digital universe, connecting all shared virtual reality. Digital tribes. I miss what I never knew. I'll take you, you out to creep. dinner. Leave me alone. I have a boyfriend. Let's have a, a let's have a drink. Let's have a drink. Leave me alone. Let's have I a drink. Have a I'll meet Get you back here face. at eight o'clock. I miss my brother. I'm with you. Programmable matter. Kuz's biological mutant warfare plans must be stopped. Who am I? What am I? It's a killer with unidentifiable DNA? In AI, fright and interest are not far from each other. Things can become real in your mind. I trust you completely. And you believe things you wouldn't ordinarily believe. Who's there? Justice is served. This is where we bring you all to rot and die. Kate, I will love you for all eternity. We will live in a virtual metaverse, a virtual universe, living in our own world every day. Everyone has the right to love and peace. I'll be right here. Neil Breen is a guy who um, people will often sort of the elevator pitch I think for most people when they're describing a Neil Breen movie is like if uh, you combined Tommy Wiseau with David Lynch um, which I think is not a totally inaccurate uh, way I think it gives you a good idea of what to get it what you're getting into um, so, Breen has a lot of, you know, very strong tropes in his films. He's interested in, you know, a, a number of, of particular ideas that show up repeatedly in his movies. He's had five films so far uh, in his career, going back to 2005. And so, Twisted Pair uh, is the, you know, he... So, Breen, people started kind of paying attention to... And noticing Neil Breen after the release of his third film, Fateful Findings, which came out in 2013, I believe. And so, you know, by the time a couple years after that had passed, um, people were paying attention to him more. But in the five years since then, 
it's much, much more, um, uh, you know, certainly not in the mainstream by any sense of the imagination, but, but like, he's, he's a pretty popular guy. Um, so Neil Breen is a middle-aged architect from Las Vegas, Nevada, who self-finances his ultra-low-budget, independent uh, science fiction thriller films, um, which he writes, directs, produces, uh, and stars in, and does, you know, most of the stuff for it himself. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's got that sort of auteur, Tommy Wiseau sort of thing going on, uh, as well. Uh, and, um, his films often feature him playing a character who is either like a sort of spy who is like the most badass guy in the entire world or playing like a god or a god-like entity or in the case of this film Twisted Pair he plays kind of both at the same time um, so this is a film about two identical twin brothers, um, named Cade and Kale, who are hybrid human artificial intelligence alien cre creature people, um, and, uh, they both have broken away from each other because they have conflicting, uh, sort of ideas about the direction for the future of humanity. Um, you know, you could be reductive and say that, um, one is the good one and one is the bad one, but it's a little more complicated than that, I guess. Of course, um, uh, Cade, I believe, is the good one. Or maybe Kale is the good one. Um, but then the the, the evil one is designated by him wearing a very, very poor quality fake beard uh, to differentiate between the two of them. Um, this movie has an incredible amount of green screen and really poorly done CGI, which was a new addition to Breen's oeuvre, uh, his, his, you know, things he had to work with. Um... This is a very fun and enjoyable movie. I, I love Neil Breen. There's something so fascinating, endlessly fascinating about his films and um, and about him as a person. He's very enigmatic. You know, he, uh, he does give interviews occasionally, but is v extremely reticent to talk about himself um, and very little is known about his background or his personal life. He grew up somewhere on the East Coast, has lived most of his adult life in Las Vegas. He work, He is an architect. He People often uh, incorrectly say that he's a real estate agent. He has said that he had a real estate license for a short period of time, but never really did anything with it. Um, And he's very uh, insistent that his films are not cult films. They are not, um, you know, trying to be any sort of outsider art. These are intended to be, you know, mainstream, popular films, just with a low budget. Um, which is fascinating to me, that he could have that be his vision. It is just so at odds with the truth that he is delusional. There is no way around it. And when and and when you take in his whole everything about him as a whole, all of his films have the only way you, you can get them. He has recently put uh, a couple of them up uh, as VOD that are insanely expensive. I think it's like almost twenty bucks to buy a digital copy of them. His first two films, he has taken off the market. There is no legal way to watch them at all. And his other three films, 
the only way to watch them, besides the expensive VOD, is that each of them have their own, like, web 1.0 dot biz website. Each movie has its own individual website that is this long chunk of text, quotes from unattributed reviewers or people from screenings and things, accolades the movie has received, and then you can PayPal him money to buy it, the movie. And they're like $35, and you get a burned DVD-R in a plain jewel case with no art. Um, the DVD-R, I will say, it's like a professionally printed DVD-R, like from a place that does like video transfer type stuff. I'm assuming that's how he's getting them made. It's not like a like a blank DVD-R that you would get at the store that he's like written on with Sharpie. So it's, it, it is at least that. Uh, but still, $35 for a DVD-R with no case is a lot. Um, and it's only DVD, no Blu-ray, you know, for, for his films. Um, and I, so I don't own any of his movies because, um, you know, I want to support him for sure. But I, I that's a little much, you know for my budget I did uh, you know um, Twisted Pair uh, had uh, you know a sort of roadshow uh, debut and it did have a Minneapolis screening for its debut uh, at the Trilon which I mentioned earlier and then in the months leading up to its debut um, this local uh, film series that's uh done at the trial and called trash film debauchery they screened three of his previous movies they screened uh double down and then i am here now and then faithful findings and faithful findings they screened the same night as twisted pair as a double feature um and so i went to all four of those screenings uh, it was absolutely wonderful to get to see those movies in a movie theater with a full house of people although um like i said you know people who like these kinds of movies who are really into the so bad it's good uh, world are often not my favorite people. I think that they're very mean and uh, pretentious a lot of the time. Um, but I'll save some of my thoughts for later because because Neil's going to show up again. After this, I'm combining these two into one. Um, it is... Uh, Best Friends, Volumes 1 and 2, uh, directed by Justin McGregor. Um, they have a 2.6 out of 5 from the year 2017. These movies were written by Greg Sestero and starring Greg Sestero and Tommy Wiseau. Trust me, friendship before money. Can you say that? Yeah. What? Well, trust me, friendship before money. Right. Yeah. I have a good story for you. A familiar story. One guy meet another in a big city. They have dream, but something change. Greed, hatred, and jealousy. You understand the words? leads from the room um so tommy acts in this film but he is not he's neither the writer nor the director uh greg sestero uh who was the uh second lead in the room and he also wrote the memoir the disaster artist which was adapted into the james franco movie he is the writer here um and he wrote the movie as a vehicle for him and tommy with the, them in mind for the roles uh and it is a very 
uh, big, you know, it's a two-parter, so it's like three and a half hours long in its full length. Um, and you no, know, I when it came out, they released it only as like a Fathom Events thing, like one screening, um, and I didn't go. And uh, then you know, a year and a half or so later, they did an event at the tra the Alamo Draft House here where they screened both of them and Greg Sestero came and did a QA and a and a photo op signing thing. Uh, and so I went to that with my friend Alex and, um, which is my first time seeing the movie. And, um, I had met Greg before I met him and Tommy at a screening of the room in 2010. Um, but I liked the movie so much that I bought the Blu-ray of it from him and had him sign it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this movie, it's, you know, I think people like, you know, really want to shit on it and act like it's bad because of it being Tommy Wiseau, but it's actually like a really interesting, fascinating, weird, lovely movie, um, that is probably too long, but is maybe perfect because it's so long? I don't know. It's about a guy, a sort of drifter, who starts working for this eccentric mortician, played by Tommy Wiseau, who hoards dental scrap, which is like gold teeth and shit, and then um, the drifter guy, played by Greg, convinces him to try and start a business where they sell the dental scrap and then things get out of control and uh, you know, paranoia is happening and uh, then it gets very weird and noir-ish and the second half is just totally bonkers. Um, you've got cowboys and like... Man, it's just a weird 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 movie let me see what i said about it when i saw it first half okay this is just my, my review for the first half was just a quote that he said that greg said at the q a i wanted someone who had no idea who tommy was to watch this film and think he was some kind of daniel day lewis type actor And then the second half, I said, <laughs> Uncle Rick is the David Lynch version of Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> I think that if you like The Room, you should see these movies. Um, they're, they're quite fun, and uh, they're not badly made at all, actually, I would say. Um, they're maybe a little rough around the edges, but... They're very weird and interesting, and Tommy is captivating. You know, uh, anytime he's on screen, he's an enigma. And, uh, yeah. After this is The Room. A perfect world. These are for you. Thanks, honey. They're beautiful. A perfect life. I would do anything for my girl. I love you, Lisa. I love you, Johnny. He provides for you. Darling, you can't support yourself. I don't love him anymore. He didn't get his promotion. And he got drunk last night. And he hit me. It's not true. I did not hit her. Well, maybe you should have a girl, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I have one already. I don't know yet. We can't do this anymore. Johnny's my best friend. This will be our secret. Don't worry. You can trust me. We are expecting! <laughs> I'm your future husband. You sure about that? Please talk to me, please! You're having an affair with Lisa, aren't you? I need more from life than what Johnny can give me. She's a sociopath. She can't love anyone. There is no baby. I told him that to make it interesting. But you're such a manipulative witch. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting our friendship. I treat you like a princess. And you stab me in the back. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! <laughs> Hey, Danny. Where's my money, Danny? Put the gun down. What the hell is wrong with you? Just shut up. Oh. Oh, hey, stop. Stop. stop it up with this world. The Room, 
a film with the passion of Tennessee Williams. Um, you know, uh, little needs to be said. 2.6 out of 5, 2003, directed by Tommy Wiseau, starring, written, Tommy Wiseau. Um, I think pretty much everybody is familiar with this at this point, now that the James Franco movie happened. Um, you know, uh... I think that this movie gets held up maybe, you know, when people talk about this brand of, like, so bad it's good movie. Um, I think that there are movies that I think fit into that category that are more enjoyable that I like a lot more. The Neil Breen movies I like a lot more than The Room, I would say. But I can't argue with The Room. It is just a, a crazy microcosm of perfection that is singular and so brain bending and seeing it in a theater is a lot of fun usually um i haven't seen it in a theater in a while it was back when i saw it in the theater it was a, it was pretty chaotic you know 2010 uh there was a lot of drunk people screaming and throwing things i think that this this movie has captivated so many people for a reason it's hard to really argue with it up next, uh, we have another appearance from my boy Neil. It's his most popular film from, like I said before, the year 2013. It is Fateful Findings with a rating of 2.5 out of 5. I was given paranormal powers as a child. I've hacked into just about all the information I need. They have no idea. No more books! You were given a power. Others want to take this from me. He's writing about government secrets. I knew I loved you when I was eight years old. All this time, I haven't been working on my next book. I've hacked into the most secret government and corporate secrets. I'm using it to make a real difference. And I'm going to expose them all. Should I be afraid? Should we be afraid? I'm not ready for this! I want to be honest with all of you. I've been hacking into government and corporate systems all over the country. You're going to get yourself killed. But you should be scared, because it is the truth. Act now on your own, outside of the corporate systems and these incompetent politicians. You want to get out of here, but you can't see what's about to happen. Fable Findings is a story about a man named uh, uh, Dylan, who uh, is a novelist, but he's trained in computer science, and uh, at the outset of the film there's a series of scenes that don't make a ton of sense where um, two children discover a mushroom that turns into a little box that has a cube in it that he takes and then now that he's an adult he carries this cube with him but then he's struck by a car and has to go to the hospital, but then he leaves the hospital, and then there's some sort of interaction between the cube that's giving him almost like superpowers, and then he takes it upon himself to expose the lies of the world. So he starts hacking into all of these government databases, these corporate databases, to uncover corruption in the world. Um, but all of that is kind of taking a back seat 
to this weird ass love triangle story uh where he's got his his bitch wife that he doesn't like who's an opiate addict and then he meets this girl that ends up being the girl from when he was a child um and he falls in love with her it's a very 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 strange movie that i have seen 15 times and i still don't really understand a lot of it um it is extremely obtuse and confusing and weird just very weird uh i think it makes sense that it's his most popular movie um because it's probably the most like approachable and uh like consistent maybe of all of his movies it's also one of the more available ones it's one of the the two that are available on vod um Neil is just, like, such an enigma. I just want to, like, hear his thoughts. He's just so fascinating to me. I really wish I could understand him and his films. His films are, like, someone with lead poisoning having a fever dream of a Philip K. Dick book. But, like, put on by a community theater troupe it is just there's nothing like it there is nothing like it i i cannot even begin to think of anything like it and that's why he's one of my favorite filmmakers next is another one that most people probably haven't heard of um from 1984 directed by uh henry sala it is nightmare weekend you are about to enter the 21st century of terror. Nightmare Weekend, when computer technology goes mad. Now you're gonna die! You die! And high-tech action gets out of control. Nightmare Weekend. A group of college students were invited to spend a pleasure weekend in a mansion. But instead experienced a Nightmare Weekend. Nightmare Weekend. The first high-tech terror film. Witness an experiment so frightening that it will never leave your mind. Die! <laughs> Experience a lust for power so gruesome that you may lose your mind. Nightmare Weekend. When horrifying humans team up with murderous machines. When modern technology gets out of human control, the action never stops. Nightmare Weekend. It's the first high-tech terror film. Nightmare Weekend. The 21st century of terror. Read it off. And this one I'm going to again consult my original review. Uh, this one's a short review, though. This movie is fucking bonkers. Shit like this, it's what I live for. It's mostly incomprehensible, but also impossible to take your eyes off of. It also features an AI supercomputer that is represented by a little hand puppet. The man with the worst facial hair, fake facial hair, this side of a Neil Breen movie, drinks out of a flask which is hidden between two pieces of bread. That's right. He has a secret booze sandwich. Incredible. 
Um, honestly, I don't remember this movie super well. Um, in 2019, after I quit my job at Half Price, I had like a prolonged period of time where I was uh, not working uh, before I went back to school, and I had acquired this huge number of movies over my time working at Half Price that I had not watched, and I tried to undertake this project that I called the Movie Watchening, uh, where I tried to watch all of them, or as many of them as I could, and I ended up watching a lot of them. I watched like 400 movies in like five months, um, and I found a lot of really good ones, um, and a lot of really bad ones, And but one of the downsides is that I just watched so many of them that I did not retain a lot of the movies, um, and this is one of those unfortunate cases where I need to... I need to watch this one again. The synopsis on uh, Letterbox says, A female scientist performs experiments on three college girls that turns them into drooling, murderous mutants. Um, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I think that, that among people who are fans of, like, 80s B-movies, horror movies, this is a pretty well-liked one. Uh, but maybe the general population, not so much. It's not super popular movie. It's only got 1.3 thousand ratings uh, on here. Most of which I'm assuming is probably because uh, this did get put out on Blu-ray <clears throat> by uh, Vinegar Syndrome, I believe. Um, it's, it's just really good, really fun. I really need to watch it again. 2.5 out of 5 this one has. Next, another very famous uh, bad movie from 1991, uh, legendary Amir Shervan's Samurai Cop. Don't move. What are you going to do, shoot me? So they call him Samurai, huh? His real name is Joe Marshall. They call him Samurai. He speaks fluent Japanese. Omaha, Yamaha, whatever his face's name is, right? Are you Fuji, Fujiyama? He got his martial arts training from the masters in Japan. He was brought over here from the police force in San Diego to fight us. I want him dead! I want his head cut off and brought here! I want his head on this piano! I will bring you his head and I will place it on your piano. And we'll see who the real samurai is. Damn. God damn you guys. All you've done is cost me bloodshed and mayhem. Who hired you? Tell me who hired you to kill a cop. Hey, look. Police, don't move. You're under arrest. Stop. Hey, counselor. <laughs> we'll see you in court. <laughs> Well, this one's dead, too. Not captured alive. Have you been circumcised? Well, your doctor must have cut a big portion of it off. No, he, uh, he was a good doctor. Now, I'm telling these son of a bitches that if they continue killing our children, I'll have their stinking bodies in garbage bags and ship them back to Japan for fertilizer. Got it? like somebody stuck a big club up my ass and it hurts we've got to figure out a way to get it out of there you know uh this movie is just like so much fun man god damn this movie is so much fun um when japanese organized crime embeds itself within los angeles the police turn to one man to take down the deadly yakuza joe marshall aka the samurai with his fearless swagger and rock hard jaw the samurai tears a two-fisted hole through the mob and doesn't stop until the job is done. Um, so this is one of those movies, similar to The Room, where it's being made by a person who English is not their first language. And um, so it's everyone speaks in this incredibly stilted, weird, alien-like cadence and syntax. Um, and he, Amir Shervan refused to allow anyone to change any of their dialogue. Um... He also would only, like, let people do, like, one take for everything, so, the, you know, there's a lot of weird, bad takes in it. Um, the action is very silly uh, and not good. Uh, famously, they finish shooting, and then uh, Matt Hansen, the uh, lead actor, uh, cut his long hair off 
and then Amir Shirvan decided they needed to do reshoots and freaked out, and so half of the movie, Matt Hansen is wearing this really, really bad wig. Uh, and it falls off during a fight scene, and they left that in the movie. Um, you know, this is just, like, a pretty good um, major example of just, like, a movie that was made very quickly, very cheaply, with very little care. Um, you know, fast and loose, get it done as quick as we can, send it straight to video. Um, but then it developed this sort of cult following. Um, there were a lot of... Uh, uh, urban legends about this movie for a long time Matt Hansen like never acted in anything again and there were all these rumors about him dying in a car accident and all these things before uh, he was eventually like found uh, people hunted him down uh, and then they ended up making a sequel Amir Shervin was not involved because he uh, passed away many years ago uh, the sequel was kind of a sort of like pretty lame attempt to kind of cash in on the success and it's like when people try to be bad on purpose it's never good it's never fun that's how i felt about birdemic 2 a very similar kind of vibe where it just like you know they're trying too hard to be bad and it just doesn't work it has to be an accident you can't you can't force it um Samurai Cop is great, though. Um, I don't think it's streaming or on VOD or anything, it doesn't look like. Um, which is shocking to me. But uh, it is, uh, you know, available on Blu-ray. I have a Blu-ray of it. Um, and it's got Robert Zadar in it, and I love Robert Zadar. Uh, so this movie is worth the price of admittance just to see some good old Zadar-ing. Next is a movie that uh, was pretty obscure when I first saw it. Uh, only had like maybe 300 ratings on Letterboxd. Um, but then it got put out on Blu-ray by Severin and uh, became much more popular. And then somewhat recently Severin took it down and uh, put it out of print without saying anything. And I'm pretty sure that and everyone is pretty sure that it's because of the ambiguous legal uh implications of the film which were why it was such a surprise when severin put it out in the first place uh everyone sort of assumed that they had figured it out but now it seems like maybe they didn't that is 1995's cruel jaws also sometimes referred to as jaws 5 cruel jaws by the uh italian ripoff master bruno Mattai. Talk rubbish, boy. This is not the place, nor the time.
So what is Cruel Jaws? Well, it's a ripoff of Jaws. You know, it's uh, it's pretty pretty much just a ripoff of Jaws, but it's a ripoff of Jaws that steals footage from the Jaws films and uses it in the film, and also steals the music from Jaws and uses it in the film. And this is why people thought that it could never make it to, you know, be re-released. Um, when I saw it for the first time, it was a screening of it that happened at the Trilon. Uh, and it was a screening of a bootleg DVD of a VHS rip of the film, which is like how you had to watch it at the time. Um... It's a very weird, weird movie. Bruno Mattai is known for making these very sort of dreamlike, hallucinatory uh, rip-off movies that feel like, you know, the, the, the fever dream version of the original piece. And so in this one, you've got, you know, a, a kid in a wheelchair, and you've got this guy who looks exactly like Hulk Hogan, um, and, like, it's just, like, absolutely weird and inexplicable but so lovely you know um bruno matai uh this might be my favorite of his films um he has done you know a number of things like he did um zombie 3 and uh shocking dark which is a another great movie of his it's a ripoff originally shocking dark was originally released as terminator 2 but it's more of a ripoff of aliens weird movie um robo war you know um there's he he did a a couple of the um emmanuel movies he did the film violence in a women's prison which was an emmanuel movie um you know cannibal movies he's done a ton of shit tons and tons and tons of garbage um but cruel jaws might be my favorite of his um, yeah, yeah, if you can, if you can track it down, it's a fun one. Next is a movie that I have a very particular affinity for, um, and it is, you know, a pretty, uh, weird and wild movie, um, from the mind of one Chester Novell Turner, this one's got a 2.4 out of 5 on here. And uh, that is uh, Black Devil Doll from Hell. So this is a shot on video uh, horror film from 1984, pretty early in the term the the world of shot on video, shot on commercial, you know, consumer grade um, video camera 
uh, at home, you know, non-professional cast and crew, um, and uh, it is one of the weirdest things that I've ever seen in my life. And the first time I saw it, I was riveted in a way that I have rarely ever been by a movie. A lot of this movie is undeniably boring. Um, the it so it was released, you know, self-released on VHS in very low qu quantities, basically like self-distributed locally in the Chicago area where Turner was located, and it became like one of the most highly sought-after and valuable tapes in the world of VHS collecting before it was eventually. Uh, put on DVD alongside uh, Chester Turner's other movie, Tales from the Quad Dead Zone, uh, by Massacre Video uh, about ten years ago. And the uh, original VHS tape version, the distributor had cut a bunch of it out and then replaced the opening credits with a new opening credit sequence that had this like rock guitar song in the background instead of the like Casio keyboard score that Chester Turner made for the movie. Uh, but the DVD has that version as well as Chester Turner's original, uh, I guess you'd call it the director's cut, which is like 20 minutes longer and has like a s almost seven minute opening credit sequence. Um, and I don't think that the movie is better for being longer, necessarily. But watching the shorter version, it's kind of a little crazy because the cuts are so hard. Um, you know, they just had to take that master tape and slice pieces of it out. So the audio matching and stuff is, is awful. Um, so Black Devil Doll from Hell is a movie about a woman who buys a doll, this little doll with dreadlocks uh, and then it turns out that the doll is possessed by an evil spirit um, and this this woman she uh, she's like um, she's a very pure virginal woman and the black devil doll uh, is said to it will fulfill her deepest, uh, her deepest, darkest desire. And it turns out that her deepest, darkest desire is to get the shit fucked out of her by the Black Devil doll. <laughs> to just straight up get, get, uh, you know, raped might be, not be the right word, um, because she is pretty about it, uh, eventually. But she definitely has sex with the doll. Um, and the sex with the doll is, like, a lot. And it's long. It's very long. And it's very crazy. And the doll is sort of like this Freddy Krueger-like caricature that's constantly saying one-liners. Um, and the movie is just what it feels like when you smoke PCP <laughs> I think you like that's that's the closest thing that I can compare it to I think um, I am obsessed with this movie it is fucking crazy and fascinating um, unfortunately not anywhere streaming at all and the DVD, uh, the box set of the two movies by Massacre, has gone out of print and is now very expensive. Looks like they're selling for $100 on Amazon. Um, Massacre also put out a super limited edition uh, vinyl 7-inch single of the soundtrack of this movie. And I found someone on a tape group who sold... Uh, both the limited version and the regular version of it, and all of the swag that came with it, they sold it to me for... Se I spent $75 on it. <laughs> Just so stupid. I can't believe I did that. It was a time when I had a, a little bit more freedom with my money. But, um... 
Oh, man, what a crazy ass, stupid ass movie. It's just so fun. It can be pretty boring, but like when it hits, when it's hit, its high highs are like the highest of all highs ever in the history of cinema, probably. <sighs> Next. 1987. Directed by Lee Harry. 2.3 out of 5. Getting pretty low. It's Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. The nightmare began with Silent Night, Deadly Night. Need a ride, Santa Claus? Oh, no, not exactly. But it isn't over yet. In fact, the ultimate nightmare is about to begin all over again. Silent Night, Deadly Night, Part 2. Hey, you little bastard! All Ricky ever wanted was a little kindness. And all he ever got was pain. She was naughty. Now he wants revenge. And this time, Carpet Day! He's going to get it. Step by step, weapon by weapon. Naughty. Victim by victim. The terror is coming home, and he's all grown up. Silent Night, Deadly Night, Part 2. I've got a present for you! The terrifying suspense shocker you've been waiting for. Last time it threw you. This time. Bingo! It'll kill you. Silent Night Releasing Corporation presents. Silent Night, Deadly Night, Part 2. Um, Silent Night, Deadly Night is a pretty good slasher movie from the 80s. Um,. There are five Silent Night, Deadly Nights, by the way. Um, Silent Night, Deadly Night is a pretty good slasher. It's got a 3.0 on here, so significantly higher than the second one. Um, and it's about a guy who sees his parents murdered by Santa Claus, and then he has to be a Santa Claus at a store, and then he goes crazy, and he goes around, and he kills people with an axe. Pretty straightforward. Um, Silent Night, Deadly Night 2 is a really weird-ass movie where the first two-thirds of the movie are about the brother of the main character from the first movie, who is now an adult, and he is in, uh, like, a psych ward, and he's being interviewed by this, like, therapist. Um, and he's recounting the first movie. So it's like a clip show movie of the first movie with this framing device, um... And so a lot of people really hate it because it's like most of it is actually just the first movie again. I like to think of it as that it makes the first movie unnecessary because you can just watch this and get all of the best parts. The true part where this shines, though, is that framing narrative and then the final act of the film, which is its own thing. Which stars this guy, Eric Freeman, never acted in anything else, who is one of the most enigmatic and psychotic performances I've ever seen in a movie. Um, this is, of course, uh, if anybody knows this movie for anything, it's for the Garbage Day scene, which uh, is become a meme, uh, you know, in and of itself. Um, one of the most famous, uh, like, lines in bad cinema, like, ever, I, th I would say. Uh, you know, up, up there with, like, you're tearing me apart, Lisa, and, and shit like that. <sighs> Every second that Eric Freeman is on the screen is just, like, pure electricity. Um, and this movie is just, like, so much fun from beginning to end. Um, I, I'm amazed that people hate it as much as they do. Uh, because, like, it's the best of both worlds, you know? Like, it's, it's, just, it's just great. 
next we have our third and sadly final appearance from Mr. Neil Breen with his first film, 2005's Double Down. This one has a 2.3 out of 5. Las Vegas, where anything goes. Enjoy it while you can. I'm about to end it all. My name is Aaron Brand. I always thought I was doing the right thing in preparing for life. I was the first in my class in college in computer science. I joined the military and became a fighter pilot and won many medals for distinguished service. I'm now a covert agent, mercenary for any nation that wants to control another. I don't need much to live on anymore. I just eat tuna out of the can and live in the car. I control access to anything and everything even from my little, simple, brilliant setup. My orders from another country are to shut down the Las Vegas Strip for two months. I've been given this great power, but I'm so alone without the girl I love. My girlfriend and I always wanted to have children. I love you. And now all of that's been taken away from me. Confirmed. Oh, jeez. He is planning something very big. Bigger than 9-11 or any of the other larger catastrophes we caught in time after 9-11. It's me. Give me the president. Contact has been made. Governments don't dare try to kill me. Where does he go? He's on a quest. Don't ask, he's protected. You're a genius. The best. But you know that. No. This time, it's personal. I can't forget her, nor forgive them for what they did to us. Forgive me. Forgive me. It's starting now. Marriage is over. Get out. I've got the package. It's a setup. No sex. Don't ask how I found you. I know everything. It broke open. Run! Holy shit, it's him! So many questions. I'm so confused. I can't go on with this. I can't go on with this. I'm an American. I'm an American. I love this country. My country. You're, you're Our daughter Megan was just diagnosed with brain cancer. Oh no, I'm so sorry. An assassination. We want to kill someone. describes it as an edgy action thriller i guess uh a you know secret agent computer hacker genius uh has to perform a sort of terrorist attack on the las vegas strip um but as it has says here he is constantly fighting his fits of overwhelming depression and obsession with love and death he's haunted by the ghost of his dead wife who was uh, the recipient of a bullet meant for him. She was assassinated right in front of him. And now he, you know, he's the secret agent hacker extraordinaire who lives in his shitty car and eats nothing but canned tuna. And, um, you know, uh, is constantly having these hallucinations and nightmares and waking up on the ground outside of his car which he has written the words help me on the side of with blood in his sleep. Um, there's a part where he gets a special rock that he believes gives him the ability to cure cancer by touching people. Um, you know, these movies are just absolutely beyond explanation. Uh, and this movie is just like pure adrenaline and chaos. It's my favorite Breen movie. Personally, it feels like the Rosetta Stone of his entire catalog. Um, 
It's also probably got the best production values of any of his movies. It's the only one shot on film. It's shot on 35 millimeter. Um, and it's sad that he it's not available anywhere. You know, um, he he took it off of sale. You can't buy DVDs of this one or his second film. I am here now. Um, it's just. It's just perfect. One of my favorite movies of all time. Next is another one of the really famous uh, bad movies. Um, 1990, Claudio Fergrasso, Troll 2. Um, a movie so famous for being bad that there's a documentary about it called Best Worst Movie. <laughs> You're late. I'm sorry we had a small mishap. Here are the keys. Um, here are ours. Have a nice stay in Milbar. And you in our city. Still telling the same story, Josh? Powers of evil are very strong here. I must leave. And remember, Claudio Fergasso was a screenwriter, uh, a crony of the aforementioned um, Bruno Mattei, actually. Uh, and this was his uh, directorial debut. Um, and so I've mentioned before about, uh, you know, movies where they're written and made by people who English is not their first language, and then they refuse to allow people to, like, punch up the script and make it more natural so everybody sounds like an alien. Um, this is a, a perfect example of that. Um, this movie is pretty silly and inept in, in most ways that are conceivable um, and has some of the most like legendarily uh, bad acting and you know, performances and, and dialogue in film history. For my money, this movie is a lot more fun and enjoyable than The Room is, honestly. Um, it's just so much sillier and, and goofier and dumber, I think. Um, I think at this point it's kind of a foregone conclusion that this is like a classic of this sort of world of cinema. But um, it's got a 2.2 out of 5 on here. And... Uh, There are no trolls in Troll 2. That's, that's all I'll say. Now we're up to the top five. And it, it, most of the stuff in here is pretty spicy, I have to say. Next is another movie that's very famous for being bad, but it's not nearly as well known uh, as something like Troll 2 or The Room, but it is 
if if we're going by those metrics of like badness, it is way worse than either of those movies are. Um, it might be one of the most technically inept movies that I've ever seen in my entire life. And that is uh, 1989's Things, the Canadian shot on 8mm movie known as Things, not to be confused with Tim Ritter's movie Things from sought after in a nationwide manhunt. sensation that'll rip apart your soul. This one has a 2.2 out of 5. Um, so, the story of things, uh, if you can call it that, is about um, a man, a mad scientist, who performs experiments on his wife to impregnate her with things which are little rubber puppet monsters and then these kids these people go to this cabin where this happened and then they have to fight the things um you know that is on paper uh, what this movie is supposed to be about it feels like a prolonged sort of digression it feels like they made the movie up while they were making it like from scene to scene it doesn't feel like they know what's going to happen next the whole movie shot on eight millimeter um so of course since you can't shoot sound on eight millimeter so the whole movie is adr whole movie is dubbed over um poorly very poorly and it is just like almost headache inducing in how little sense it makes if you try to grasp on to follow what is happening in this movie it will hurt you physically um right before the pandemic started like a week or two before like full lockdown happened i went we had uh, they had the spring uh big tape swap at the alamo draft house that was organized by this guy i know tim holly who used to be a programming director for the alamo the twin cities alamo uh and then they had a secret uh horror screening 
after the tape swap and it ended up being things um and when he introduced the movie he was like this might be the biggest screen that this movie has ever been shown on uh ever uh and then that ended up being the last movie i saw in a movie theater for over a year because of the pandemic um was things which i was fine with. i thought that was very fitting almost this movie is i can't even begin to describe i can't do justice to how fucking insane this movie is and it's out there it's on shutter you know if you get shutter you can watch it um i think they did a last drive-in episode of it maybe um it is just <laughs> and and the 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 finale when you finish the movie the end title card says um you have just experienced things and i think that is the greatest ending of a movie ever in the history of cinema next is definitely the least well known of the movies that are ranked this high uh it's only got 1.3 thousand views on ratings on uh on letterboxd with a 2.0 out of 5 from 1983, directed by David Wirth, Warriors of the Lost World. Warriors of the Lost World. Mina! In another time, in a distant land, generations after the radiation wars Mina! and the collapse of nations, governments, finance, and communications, there came into existence a new dark age of tyranny. The future. The action. Mina! Mina! The adventure. Warrior of the Lost World. Starring Robert Ginty, Donald Pleasance, and Fred Williamson. Um, so this is another you know, Italian movie, rip-off movie, post-apocalyptic Mad Max rip-off type movie. Here's what I said when I saw it. Short review. I said, what the fuck is wrong with everyone? Am I going crazy? Maybe I just love these insane Italian movies more than most people, but still. This movie is flat-out bananas. One of the best insane cold opens of any movie I've ever seen. How can you hate this talking motorcycle? It is one of the things that pushes this movie over the edge into full off-the-rails territory. This feels like someone tried to write a script that was both Mad Max and Knight Rider while they were high on bath salts. How can you say no to this? Again, this was from my big movie-watching project, and I don't remember it super well. Um, I need to watch this one again, because I remember really enjoying it a lot. Um... Apparently they did a Mystery Science Theater episode of it. Um, I'm not a big Mystery Science Theater fan, personally. I don't think those guys are super funny, honestly. Um, yeah, this one's out there. You can you can find it um, and see it, and it's worth time. It's worth your time, I think. Weird that it's this lowly rated, because it's it's. I would think most people would have sort of a, like a meh feeling about it, if anything. But I really liked it a lot. I thought it was really fun. Number three on this list is a really despicable movie that almost everybody despises. Um, and I don't. I love it. And I know that I shouldn't and that I'm a bad person for liking it. And I have no excuse, really. I'll, I'll explain why I like it, but um, I'm acutely aware of the fact that I shouldn't. 2011. Tom Six. The Human Centipede 2. Full sequence. Hey, I hope you're not time-wasting, you. I've got a dozen people waiting to look at this place. Hey, come on, let's get this lease signed, eh? I'm 
here today because your mother is very worried about you. He keeps on talking about a centipede with 12 people. <laughs> what does that mean? The centipede can be considered a phallic symbol. The centipedes are very aggressive creatures. Ian, yeah, please! Their bite can be very painful. What are you looking at? Maybe he's connecting the pain that a centipede inflicts with the psychological and sexual abuse inflicted on him by his father. There's nothing to worry about. I'm sure it's just a passing phase. Hmm? What is this? 100% medically accurate. One digestive system. Is this a perverted film you've been talking about? This isn't right, Martin. What you're doing, it's wrong. I'm doing it! It's a film! You were sending me to film! <laughs> Human Centipede, the first one, is like a, a good but not great horror movie that's pretty gross, um, but it's not, you know, I don't think it's nearly as, as bad as uh, its reputation might lead you to believe. But it did get that reputation, and so Tom Six <clears throat> made sequel he made three actually there's three human centipedes and the, the third one is um like just not it's it's like tr it's trying too hard i think personally and i think that he doesn't have he's run out of ideas at that point too it doesn't work very well for me the second one though is just man um right, let's let's consult my review here, um, from when I watched it for the first time, I am honestly baffled by the amount of hate that this movie gets, as well as its predecessor. People like to decry that this movie is pointless, a movie made just to shock. Honestly, though, what makes this different than 95% of all slasher movies, other than the extremity of the content? This movie has more to say than something like Madman, or The Prowler, both of which are movies that serve only as platters to deliver you teenagers being murdered in entertaining ways. The fact that people are saying things like that this movie is irredeemable, or that it is a terrible movie, is honestly incredibly disappointing to me. Just because this movie is not your bag, and I am sure that it is not most people's bag, does not mean that it is not a well-made movie. It is, in fact. Particularly, I want to sing the praises of Lawrence Harvey, the lead actor in the film, who manages to deliver what I think has to be one of the best lead performances in the history of horror, and he does not even speak in the entire fucking movie. He is absolutely riveting throughout this movie, yes, even when he is masturbating with sandpaper, and the fact that the narrative thrust of the movie is his character Martin's story, driven by Harvey's incredible performance, makes the movie, to me, very watchable. Also, I think this movie is really funny. I don't think I would call it a comedy, necessarily, but it is definitely funny, and it is definitely purposefully funny, much more so than the first one is. It actually reminded me a lot of Freddy Got Fingered, which I mentioned earlier, a personal favorite. Taken out of context, there are a few scenes in this movie that could be interchanged with that one fairly fluidly. The humor is great because it relieves the tension of how fucked up and disgusting everything else that's happening in the movie is. I watched this as a double feature with August Underground Mortem, a very notoriously fucked up serial killer movie, um, considered one of the most disturbing movies of all time, whatever. Um, I have to say, watching this immediately after August Underground Mortem was probably a great help in downplaying the fucked upness of it, where awful things would happen in that film and would just make me feel like shit, 
and make me want to look at my phone instead of the screen, the terrible things that happened in this movie made me laugh because they were just so outrageous and ridiculous. There were a number of really, really over-the-top spots that were absolute edgelord shit. The sandpaper masturbation, centipede rape, the baby in the car. But they were so unreal. Maybe I am just a shitlord, edgelord, but I laughed, partly out of horror, partly out of disbelief, partly out of the fact that someone actually made a movie with these things in it. I don't know. I really liked this. And I stand by that, you know? It is definitely edgelord shit. It is definitely uh, shock shit. It is not going to be everyone's bag. It is just trying to be as, as reprehensible as possible. But I like that. You know, I, I'm interested in that. I think that, you know, if you're... If you first came to me because, uh, you know, I was, I made, I, I got a lot of subscribers when I made that video with Juan at Plagued by Visions, and, you know, he's really interested in disturbing media, literature, and, and film, and this is a very disturbing movie, I would say. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting because, unlike most disturbing movies, it's meant to be funny, you know? It's meant to make you laugh at things you shouldn't be laughing at. And I, I think that's valuable, personally. Number two, one of my all-time favorite films. Um, this is another very popular uh, bad movie. Um, 1988, the immaculate Stuart Raffle. The film is Mac and Me. They were an average alien family living on their own planet. And we were an average family living on ours. He took my Coke, Mom. Come on, you guys. I don't have it. I didn't take it. I knew it! Accidents happen, and like us, they found themselves in a strange new neighborhood. I like it. Me too. Shh. Communing with the Earth spirits. Welcome to California, bud. Alert, alert. We have a malfunction. We have a malfunction. Their lives were in danger. No! Back off, Larry. Get away from it. We've got a problem here. They had to escape. When the smoke cleared, their family was separated. Somehow, one of the aliens was hiding in our house. The government wanted to capture him. It's here. Everyone was after him. And my brother, Eric, wants to make friends. We got him! Get him! Turn it off! You suck this living thing into a vacuum cleaner? Yeah, and then we blew him out again. Now Eric is risking not only his life, but my life. Give me the gun. Step back! To save them. This is the police. It's about more than friendship. It's about adventure. Mac and me. Um, this is a children's movie. I didn't see this movie as a child, so I have no nostalgia for this movie. I saw this movie for the first time as a full-grown adult um, in my tw in my twenties, in my late twenties. And it just uh, warps my brain. It's so weird and gross and upsetting and funny and unfortunate. Uh, and I just love it so much. You know, it's it's best known because whenever Paul Rudd would go on Conan, instead of playing a clip from whatever movie he was promoting, they would play the clip where um, the lead character, uh, Eric, who's in a wheelchair... Uh, uncontrollably rolls down a mountain and then falls off of a cliff into a river um, immediately followed by stop motion animated Mac the little alien nightmare creature seeing that happen um, which is a, one of the funniest parts of the movie for sure but the whole movie is just like a, a bad acid trip of a kids movie um, the aliens are so gross and upsetting and 
horrible to look at, but in a way that's so captivating and you can't take your eyes off of it. Um, the part near the finale when the family of aliens goes into the grocery store is like one of my favorite scenes in a movie ever. It's just like, it is indescribable the bliss that that scene instills in me. It is like pure lines of serotonin for my brain. Um, one of my long sought after possessions that I want to own someday is the Japanese laser disc of this film that has the original cut where um, uh, Eric the child is shot by the police and killed before being resurrected by Mac in the f final scene of the film, penultimate scene of the film. In the American version, uh, the police shoot and miss and then cause an explosion, and the explosion kills Eric. Um, but in the original version, which is available in Japan on home video, and you can see the scene on YouTube, they shoot the kid, and they squibbed him up. They blow his fucking shit out in this children's movie. Psycho shit, dude. Crazy shit. Um, lovely, though. Lovely movie. Um, Shout Factory put out a very nice Blu-ray of this movie a couple years ago for its, uh, I believe it was for the 25th anniversary or the 30th anniversary. Um, and you can get that and watch it, and it is worth, worth watching, absolutely. It just... I have a Japanese one-sheet post theatrical poster of this movie that's just the hands, his his like hand thing where they do the the woo or they like call to each other. I was pretty obsessed with this movie for a little while. Um, I've watched it many many times, and it is it is very very good. One of my favorites. And the number one. The movie with the worst rating uh, that I've given a 5, and it's by a pretty wide margin. This has a 1.5 out of 5, and the lowest you can give a movie is 0. 0.5. So this is like, this is very low. 1987, Rod Amento, it's the Garbage Pail Kids movie. Once upon a time, or was it more recently, there was a young boy named Dodger. He was the sort of child who was always left out of things. Each day after school, Dodger works in a junk shop owned by the mysterious Captain Mancini. Which is broth and vampire's brew. Make these clothes as good as new. <laughs> Dodger has never had a family or a friend he could call his own. Until now. The Garbage Pail Kid. Starry Nat Nerd. Windy Winston. Messy Tessie. Give him a chance, Tangerine. You'll like it. Ali Gator. Valerie Vomit. Lisa Gregg. I'm gonna get fired for this. Foul Phil. Nice to the topes. The Garbage Pail Kids movie. They may not be pretty, but boy, they make great friends. Starring Anthony Newley and Mackenzie Aston. The Garbage Pail Kids movie. Um, another movie that is... For children? I guess? <laughs> So the Garbage Pail Kids were a line of trading cards that was a parody of the Cabbage Patch Kids, and they were all gross and did gross things. Um, 
and they were very popular, and so they made a movie out of it. My review of it wasn't very detailed, it looks like. I said, anyone who thinks this is the worst movie they've ever seen has not seen many bad movies. This movie just gets me. Can you imagine if they made a kid's movie like this nowadays? This movie is just, like, so, 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 so stupid and uh, gross, and, but it's, like, the ultimate, like, little boy movie. Like, they're just constantly farting and pissing their pants and being dumb, and it's kind of like a Gremlins ripoff. <sighs> again, I can't remember it super well. I, like, I saw, again, I saw this for the first time, you know, in my late 20s, um... But I just, I just felt like this movie was, like, wonderful. Like, it was just, like, indescribably stupid in a way that I found to be absolutely riveting. And, um, you know, most, you know, when you look at a lot of these so bad they're good movies that are on this list, when you look at the, the graph of the ratings, it's going to be kind of like a big U, where there's going to be a bunch of really high and a bunch of really low. Um... Because there's people like me who are rating them very high, and then there's people who are maybe of a more traditional frame of mind where they're rating them very low. This one is just low. There are not people rating this movie high. Um, there are six and a half thousand people who have rated this movie on Letterboxd. I am one of 99 who have given it a five star rating, which accounts for 3% of the total ratings. Whereas, 40% of the people who watch this movie gave it a half star, the lowest rating that they can. I can't even really describe with words how weird this movie is. It's just like, I, it doesn't make sense that it even exists. And it's, you know, uh, supposed to be a children's movie, but I just imagine that if children watched this, they would be terrified and horrified and have nightmares you know it's it's just so weird and upsetting and gross but i really love it i really like it a lot you know it's not my favorite movie on this list but uh i stand by giving it five stars i did not you know apologize for that all right anyways that was my long list of things that people don't like that i do um you know Maybe I'll, I'll think about doing an opposite list of hot takes that are maybe a bit more spicy. But there aren't many things that, like, are really well liked that I would give, like, a super duper low rating. My hot takes are going to be, like, something that people really like. I'm kind of mid on, you know. But maybe that's interesting, too. Anyways, I hope, I hope you found this entertaining uh, and enjoyable. And thanks for watching.